Hello and welcome to today's podcast. I'm super excited to be here with Stephanie Higgs today. Now you might remember Stephanie just from a couple of weeks ago. She was talking to us about those early years of school. And so we're really excited to have her back. And today we're talking about growing creativity in gifted kids. Well, not just gifted kids, really anyone. Us too, the parents, our creativity can grow. Who knew? Maybe you feel like you are a creative person or you're, you're like, nah, I'm not creative. I don't play the guitar. I don't do this. I don't do that. Well, actually, we all have that creativity inside us. And it's really interesting to learn that it's actually like a muscle that we can build and grow and get better at, become more creative. So it's a wonderful episode today. Stephanie always comes along with so many tips and tricks and you walk away feeling like you can do a million things. So if you didn't catch our last episode with Stephanie, let me tell you a little bit about her. She became a gifted educator and differentiation coach in 2019, where staff quickly named her Teacher of the Year before being named Region Level Semi-Finalist for the Tennessee Teacher of the Year. She's also honoured with the TAG, Tennessee Association for the Gifted Horizon Award, which is given to a gifted educator demonstrating promise and leadership in the field. She's also been the Tennessee Performing Arts Center Teacher of the Year, and she recently graduated with an additional graduate degree from Tennessee State University in Instructional Leadership. She now serves on the executive board as a secretary for the Tennessee Association for the Gifted. Now, she is a very, very passionate primary school teacher, and her energy is infectious. It's always an absolute delight to catch up with Stephanie. She has so much wisdom to share with us and always comes with a bucket of ideas. I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did. If you love the podcast, you can support us in many ways. Leave us a review. Just leave us some stars. You can subscribe. Tell your friends about us. And if you really love us, you can leave us a tip or join the podcast patron. Take care. Enjoy the episode. And I'll see you again soon. Hi, I'm Sophia Elliott. As a parent of three gifted kids, I'm here to talk about all things gifted. Because I've been isolated and uncertain, and I felt like that parent, then I found peace of mind, support, and my community. This podcast is about sharing that journey, actually parenting gifted kids, and connecting with advice and support. So we have everything we need for every member of our family to thrive. This is the Our Gifted Kid podcast. I'm super excited today to be back with Stephanie Higgs, our like gifted educator extraordinaire with all of her energy all the way from the US. <laughs> Stephanie, how are you going today? I'm great. I'm so thankful to be back with you. I just felt so warmly received the last time I had to get right back on your calendar. <laughs> I, I know. I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation around those first years of school and I just, your energy is infectious and I am delighted to have you on the show and your generosity at kind of just sharing your wisdom and knowledge with everyone, hugely appreciated. So thank you for coming back and we're going to talk about creativity today. How cool is that? Yes, I'm so excited. This is such a passion of mine. So I'm thrilled to be able to share a few of my favorite ideas with parents of gifted learners and anyone else who might be listening. Absolutely. I, yeah, I have a big, a big passion for creativity myself. And it's one of those things where folk will often say, uh, oh, I'm not creative. You know, I can't play the guitar. I can't sing, you know, and, or I can't paint and have this idea around what creativity is. So I guess my first question is let's break that down a little bit. What would you say creativity is and can we become more creative? Oh, I love that. So I love to play myth busters, especially in gifted education. I think there are all sorts of myths that are prevalent out there. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think lots of us, you know, adults, kids, I'll I'll kind of hear this spoken over lots of different people, but, oh, I'm not creative. Oh, that's, that's not really my space. You know, like you mentioned, I'm not good at this instrument or this type of specific fine art or performing art talent. So I must not be creative at all. And so what I really love to kind of demystify there is the idea that creativity can be taught and it can evolve. And so all of us uh, can constantly be growing in that. I have a couple of theories I'll kind of reference here in a second to to support that a little more than just, you know, the opinion of one gifted educator. (laughs) But what is it? What is it not? 
And I think when we think about creativity, I think it's any time we're thinking about a new way of doing something and any time that we're demonstrating, you know, kind of growth or change. And so I think a lot of times, you know, when we think about the famous inventors of our time, um, and quite often, more often than not, they're solving a problem. They're looking at something in their everyday life and saying, ah, oh, there's got to be a better way. That's really taxing. That's really tedious. There has to be a quicker way and more cost efficient way. And so creativity can look like that, where it's not necessarily splattering paint on a wall, but it's problem solving. So I think a lot of the different models that we have for critical and creative thinking can really kind of shape the way that we're developing, especially in our young kind of gifted kiddos and that gifted population how we're teaching them to think and and kind of changing that mindset from a more fixed mindset to a growth mindset of, well, what does creativity look like? Does it have to be pencil and paper and, and fine arts? Does it look like visual arts and performing arts? Does it even look like creative problem solving that might be in, you know, a company that works with math and numbers or science? And something else I think it's important to think about, too, is the idea of how many famous failures we have. I have some lessons that I do with some of my students about either how often they were told no before they were ever told yes, or how often they were unsuccessful before finally in their, you know, 900th attempt, they found success. And so I think there's a lot of social emotional development that it can occur through refining creative processes as well. Learning to push through failure, developing stamina, developing perseverance, grit, I think is such an important skill in the 21st century. And so I think all of those can be developed through creativity. But I think anytime you're being innovative, thinking about things in new ways, thinking about something that maybe has never been done before, all of those can be defined as creativity. It's a lot more than just being, you know, strong in art, I think. And I think sometimes people immediately associate, oh, that's not really, that's not my speed, you know. And I even hear that a lot in teachers of, oh, I'm not really creative. Here's the secret. I don't know a teacher who's not creative. It just might not be that they have cute bubbly handwriting and they make great posters or, you know, something like that. But again, when we kind of broaden that definition of what creativity even looks like, I think a lot more of us fit under that umbrella than we would initially think. And then even those of us who don't feel like it comes as naturally, that's one of the things I'm here to share today is how can we grow and refine that area of talent. I couldn't agree with you more. And and as you're talking there, I've, I've got all these things popping in my head. Uh, one of the first things was a TV series that I watched last year. And I will try and find it and put it in the links because I'm so bad with names and I just can't remember the guy's name, but it was all about brain training. And he did this exercise to assess his creativity. And then he had to do all of these uh so that he did the exercise, he had this, he got a score for creativity, right? From this expert in the US somewhere. And then he had to do all this brain training for a month and then do another activity to and assess his creativity. And they actually demonstrated, like you said, that creativity can be learnt and, and like improved upon this sort of idea of creative thinking. And I had flashbacks to... So my first, uh, my undergrad was actually in fine arts way back in the day. And so I was, a, a, a lit, you know, an artsy, creative person. But, but then I went and worked in politics for most of my 20s and some of my 30s. And during that time, one of my colleagues jokingly referred to my undergrad as the degree of paper mache, and, which was quite derogatory. <laughs> And I think it's clearly never quite left me, but that mm. sat with me for a while. And actually what I realized uh, on reflecting on what I was doing at the time, why I was good at it, actually all came down to my creative thinking and my ability to be creative in problem solving and, you know, appreciating other people's points of view and thinking outside the box which had all been strengthened by doing that undergrad in fine arts. And so linking this idea that actually being creative is it's like a mindset, it's an approach and a way of thinking. So I, I would love to hear more. You referenced some, some theories around creativity. Do you want to share, share a little bit of those with us? Sure. So there's really two that I've been researching and kind of delving into as of late. And the first one I think is really great for parents to know about. 
And it's the idea of the 4C model of creativity. So there are two doctors that are pretty involved in that research. One of those is Dr. James Kaufman. The other is Dr. Ronald Baghetto. And the two of them have come up with kind of this overarching model, the 4C model of creativity. And so basically, parents of the super, super young, I know, Sophia, we recently chatted about those very early kind of gifted qualities that we're seeing in these really little kiddos. Well, that can actually sometimes be defined based on this theory as the mini C level of creativity. And so that's basically when students are not necessarily doing anything that's super revolutionary, but to them, it's new and it's meaningful. So for example, I recently spent some time with friends who have a little bitty, just two years old, and he took a little cup after we were finished with our dinner and it had, you know, some kind of dressing or, or topping in there and it was empty. And so he took that cup and then somewhere else he found this tiny little ball that rolled. It was really light. And the next thing I know, I look up and he's taking that ball and he's dropping it in the cup and he's flinging the cup up in the air and running around to try to catch the ball in that cup. So how creative is that, that he kind of made something new and meaningful and made himself a game? So that's a level of creativity. We would call that that mini C level. So for him, it's new and it's meaningful, but that's that very earliest age. So that's where a lot of the parents who would be listening might find themselves, you know, kind of working with their little, with their child. So then that next level is exciting because that's really where I focus a lot of my time. And quite honestly, this might sound surprising, but I would find myself identifying as just this next level. So that first level is that mini C level of just kind of very new, very revolutionary. Well, that next level, that little C level is basically where you're still finding a lot of growth in creativity. So you have kind of identified, you have some creativity, and then there are lots of ways that we can go in and refine that creativity. And that's kind of what differentiates between the mini C creativity and little C creativity is that idea of growth, that we're learning, that we're growing, and that we're evolving as creators. It's shocking to think, okay, we started that little bitty and I'm only at the very next one. Well, that's because the next level of creativity is a pro C level of creativity. And so that's someone who is a professional creative. You know, there's tons of different careers that would involve that, but it could be things we've talked about. People that are inventors, that could be visual artists, that could be graphic designers, but people who have moved into that professional level of creativity. And then last but not least, you think, well, gosh, where do you go from there? But the last one would be the big C level of creativity. And so those are the names that we'll remember in the history books. You and I are not even sharing the same continent right now. So are there names that, that would kind of blend across all continents and be remembered well after their lifetime? So that's really kind of that last level, that big C level of creativity. So that's really kind of given me some vocabulary and some language to shape where I am as a creative, where my students are as creative. And then for all the parents who would be listening, a lot of our gifted children that you all that you all have would probably fall under either that first level, that mini C, they're really little and they're just learning and starting, or that next level, that little C level of creativity where they're starting to demonstrate growth. So that's one model. And then the other work that I really focus a lot on in gifted education, and if you are parents of gifted children, this is probably a name that's great for you to know. And that's Dr. Paul Torrance. He is a hugely famous name in gifted education. And basically, the work of Dr. Paul Torrance focuses on four tenets of creativity. And so that's fluency, flexibility, elaboration, and originality. And so I have lots of ideas kind of to help parents who are listening sort of flesh those out in your in your child and, and practice those and again, grow those. That's the ultimate idea here is that we would take what level of creativity we're kind of coming to this conversation with and that we would all be able to evolve and demonstrate growth through practicing some really specific exercises to continue growing and developing as a creative. That's a great point of reference just to understand those levels, just sort of have that broader understanding of creativity. So let's talk about, well, as parents, because uh, as you know, we're, we're always trying to go, okay, with each episode, what can the parents take away with them? Uh, Steffi, I know that you've actually got some strategies that you can share with us today based on these theories uh, around sort of sparking this creativity or encouraging this creativity? Do you want to share those with us? Absolutely. So let me elaborate a little bit more. Uh -huh, that's one of Dr. <laughs> Paul Torrance's four tenets, but elaboration is one of them. Uh, let me elaborate a little bit more on what his four tenets of creativity look like and how as a parent, you might be able to apply that with 
a small child and especially a gifted learner. So the first one is fluency. So Dr. Torrance really identified that it's very important that our brains, of course, their muscles, we're trying to train our brain to think of ideas as quickly as we can. The more ideas we produce, the more creative they're going to become. Oftentimes, our first idea is not our best idea. And so if we can train our brain to generate ideas more quickly, that's going to help strengthen us as a creative. And so that could be as simple as list as many, and you could fill in the blank. List all the things you can think of that are blue. You know, that could be we're driving down the road in the car and we're just back and forth, you know, blueberry, sky, ball, you know, just as fast as we can back and forth. So then that next step would be, okay, how can I train my brain to do that a little bit faster? Well, partly just practice, right? We can just do that and continue to practice and get better. But what I teach my students sometimes is to think about categories within Okay. So, you know, I just said blueberry. Let me think if I can think of any other foods that are blue. That's going to help develop my fluency. If I can pick a category and I can go all in, I can tell you all the foods I can think of that are blue. Well, then I said the sky is blue. Well, let me think about all the things in nature I can find that are blue. All of a sudden, my brain is able to create a lot more ideas. So working on our fluency is one way to really strengthen that specific tenet of Dr. Torrance's. And even a game as simple as categories. I don't know if you've ever played the game categories, but categories, not only do you have to give very specific items and you're up against a timer, but they all have to start with the same letter. So that would be even a way to kind of advance this to that next level. Let's think of all words that start with an S that are blue. And so things like that are a great way to really develop that tenet. Another one of his tenets is elaboration. So adding as many details as you possibly can. That could be going back and forth, sharing a story, and each one of you is adding the next line to the story. You could do this orally, or you could even do this pencil and paper, but can you elaborate? Can each of you add on one sentence to the story, but it has to make sense, and then you can add a surprise twist, but it has to go along with what's been happening in the story. It could be the same with drawing, so adding as many details as you can to a picture, making that picture as exciting as possible, making that picture tell a story. So how, how can we elaborate both visually and then also orally? Another one is originality. And so for this one, I have a favorite tool that I use. You can find these on Amazon or other places online, but they're called Droodles. And that's the work of Roger Price. And basically they're very, very simple line images. So he will just have a few very simple lines. And what you could do is you could put this in a common place in your house. You know, maybe this is in the kitchen by the sink or on a board where we keep everybody's, you know, special event. But you would put up a droodle, which again is just a very simple drawing, kind of a doodle. And every time you have a new idea of what the droodle is representing, maybe you just keep a pad of sticky notes nearby and you just walk by and you add an idea to the list. And so the funny part is the gimmick, kind of the, the saying behind droodles is that you don't understand until you ask. And then it's too late to wish that you had it. And that's because a lot of the ideas that you and your family would come up with are even more original than the very simple idea that the creator had. And so how fun would it be to leave up, you know, just a very simple sketch or drawing. And every time you walk by, that could be, you know, this or that could be, let me get even more original than that. That's going to be and kind of slapping up a new mm. idea there. And then one of my favorites, I have tons of ideas here. I know sometimes listening to me can be like drinking from a fire hydrant. I just, <laughs> I, <laughs> I love it. Just as quick that. as they come. But the last of his four tenets is flexibility. And so the way I define that is other uses for an item. So that can be as simple as looking around your house and saying, okay, I'm looking at some coat hangers right now. What are other uses for a coat hanger? If it's not a coat hanger, what could it be? And so there's other kind of ways you can word that too. So like, what can you do with, I'm at my office, a, a paper clip. What are all the different things we could do with a paper clip? Well, if we unfolded it, we could use it to pick a lock. So it's not a paper clip anymore. Now it's a lock picker. You know, could we use it as a tiny little, you know, sword, like a jousting, you know, fencing sword for a squirrel, right? Because it's teeny tiny. So kind of really thinking in those really creative ways. So other uses for something, what can you do with something besides its very much intended purpose? Another sentence starter for that one can be, this used to be a blank. Now it's a blank. So, you know, this used to be an envelope, but now it's, you know, and come up with, with other uses for that item. Or you mentioned kind of outside the box thinking. So that's a fun one to use the phrase. So inside the box, this is a greeting card. 
outside the box this is and then think of other uses for that item so that's just kind of a fun one you can play you can always use like two pipe cleaners and say i want you to show me the importance of creativity use two pipe cleaners show me the importance of creativity or use two pipe cleaners and tell me what you learned about in science today so how can you demonstrate that if i just give you two pipe cleaners Another favorite of mine is forced association. So you could have just photographs. You could have them look around the house. And you could say, I want you to assign me an item that represents the topic of electricity. What's something? And it can't just be, you know, a light bulb, right? We know that's already sort of a symbol for that. I want you to find something creative that represents the idea of electricity. Letting them go around the house and find something like that or having photographs. And they have to find a photograph of an image or go online and find an image that best represents kind of that principle or that concept maybe that they're studying at school. Another favorite of mine online is a resource called Carly and Adam. So Carly and Adam create these gorgeous pictures. If you are watching the recorded video, is it recorded video this time, Sophia? Video and audio. So yeah, Perfect. listeners will be listening, but uh, we have our members will Perfect. be able to view. Yeah. Tell about so for this one, you show them half of a picture. So like for this one, Carly and Adam showed half of a snowman. So it's like the left half of a snowman. So you see kind of the half of a small circle, half of a bigger circle, half of the biggest circle. But the directions say it's not a snowman. And so Carly and Adam have these for every season. And they are an absolute blast. Because of course, when you look at it, the first thing you see is a snowman. A snowman um, they have yeah. them for a it's not a snowflake and so i did this yep. with my kiddos a couple weeks ago we're smack dab in the winter here in tennessee and so it wasn't a snowflake it was a crown and so some one of my students took that and turned that picture into a crown and so carly and had them have those for every month every season but those have been great fun for my my kiddos as well and i know they would love that sometimes recreationally in the home setting there's also a book, it's called Creativity Calendar, and it's by Laura Magner. And what I love about that book is she actually specifically addresses those four tenants monthly. So she is she kind of gives you a year to glance, mm -hmm. and you could take that, you could do it as a workbook, or you could make copies if you had multiple kiddos at home. But she actually has one exercise each month of the year for each of those four tenants, and then she starts all over. So she actually has two full sets of a fluency, a flexibility, an originality, and an elaboration. And so she, you know, for the elaboration, will just give you like a little doodle, like it'll just be one little squiggly line. And then you have to add tons of details and kind of hide that image in your bigger picture. So lots of elaboration there. So that's great fun too. One of my friends who is a teacher brought that for her, her kiddos at home. And she has said it has just been the biggest hit. She's been doing that with them in the evenings, just kind of to, to wind down, take a minute, kind of get some thoughts out on paper and, and kind of draw together. And she said she's already seeing progress. So it's fun just to see as quickly as you implement these, how quickly kiddos kind of catch on. And then another one that I love, this one's actually a membership, but it's 28 to make. But it's the idea that it takes 28 days to make a new habit. And so like one of the exercises they have on there is like a 30 circles challenge. So you have to turn each of the 30 circles into something else besides just a circle. Could it be an eyeball? Could it be a clock? Can it be anything, you know, a coin, anything you can think of that's small and circular? So you've got to think an exercise like that is going to work on fluency. How fast can you come up with ideas? What else could a circle be besides just a geometric shape? And then elaboration, can you add lots and lots of details to each one, you know, and then kind of how flexible is your thinking? When we look at that, we do just see a circle, but could we, you know, kind of get creative with what we're doing that? Could we extend and break out past the circle, have something kind of around that, that initial object? So, so those are great fun, just really quick, easy ways. Another fun one would be to take some sort of item and add it to paper. So it could be something as simple as like a piece of food. You know, it could be an M&M and you have an M&M and you put it on a piece of paper and the M&M has to be part of the picture that you make. It could be a pretzel. It could be, you know, anything that, that you have at home, but an object plus a pencil means creativity. So, so those are just a few of my favorite ones, but lots of different ways there to, to think about how we can sort of, you know, encourage that creativity. Love what you're learning from the Our Gift to Kids podcast? Why not become a supporter? The quickest way to do this is to leave a review. There's no need for an essay. Five stars will do. You can also say thanks with a one-off tip in the tip jar or become a regular supporter for as little as the price of a coffee per month. There are lots of different ways you can say thanks. Check out the link in the show notes or head to www.ourgiftedkids.com 
to find out how you can help. Another model of creative thinking that I love is called scamper. And so scamper is all about kind of going back to that original, you know, meaning I shared of creativity and the idea that it's not necessarily something that has to be visual art. It doesn't have to be performing art, that it can be really creative problem solving and innovation and maybe even inventing something new. And so the scamper model is the work of Bob E. Burrell, and each letter in scamper stands for something. And so basically you take something that already exists and you use the letters of scamper to change it. And so this is a great one for the home setting. And so I went to Lipscomb University here in Nashville for my gifted endorsement to teach. And I had Dr. Emily Mosiel. That was who first introduced me to the scamper model. But she had us try the scamper model with an Oreo. So you could, again, take something that's really basic, really classic. But then she had us go through each of the letters of scamper and try to invent or create something new. So in scamper, the S stands for substitute. Okay, so when we think about just the classic Oreo, can we think about a way to substitute either the chocolate cookie or the cream? Well, that's a great conversation because it has been done many, many times, right? Our Oreos aren't just one package on the shelf anymore. We have a whole half Mm -hmm. of a shelf full of all the variations. So they are using, whether they even call it that or know it as that, there are people, you know, kind of in the Oreo world and the Nabisco world who are using the elements of scamper. Well, we've done the chocolate cookie and the cream filling. How could we substitute? Could we use graham crackers as that cookie instead of the, you know, the chocolate cookie? Could we take out the cream in the middle? Could we substitute that for, I mean, they've done all kinds of things, peanut butter and jelly and, you know, chocolate icing and all sorts of things. So the S in scamper stands for substitute. The C stands for combine. So is there any way that we could combine two items to come up with something new? So could we combine an Oreo with something else to invent something that's not been done before? The A stands for adapt. So how could we make changes there and adapt that Oreo? Could it be the M stands for modify? So could we minimize it? Could we maximize it? Again, they've done that with the Oreo. They've got the teeny tiny little Oreo crisps. They have, you know, the jumbo double stuffed Oreo. So they, they've done some of that minimizing and maximizing. The P is put to another use, which again is that flexibility that we talked about. What are other uses for Oreos? You know, the first one that comes to my mind is we use those a lot to do moon phases at school. And so all of a sudden it's not an Oreo cookie for eating. It's an essential ingredient for your next science project. (laughs) And then the E stands for eliminator. Are there any parts of the Oreo cookie that could be eliminated? And then last but not least, the R stands for reverse. So are there, you know, could we flip it out? Could we do an inside out version? So you can take that scamper model and you can use that with anything. And your kids, you're going to be blown away by the things that they create, by the way that they rearrange, reorganize, you know, just come up with brand new ideas you've never heard of before. What if the calendar was reorganized or, re, you know, kind of if we redid those dates and reordered or reversed, you know, for that letter R. So you can use that scamper method with anything, but that's just another great way to have your kiddos practicing, thinking about what could be possible, what could exist. You know, I think for a lot of us, the older we get, the more the creativity is sort of driven out of us. I think we just kind of get in a more monotonous lifestyle. And so when we give kids these, you know, open-ended questions, the potential is just endless. Their imagination is endless. And if we foster that at really young ages, I think there's just really no telling how far this could go once they're a little bit older. Absolutely. Lots of great ideas there. And so As you were sharing those, I was kind of thinking to myself as a parent, uh, it's like, right, how could I incorporate that one? So for example, we do, you know, a bit of commuting to and from school. It's not sort of in our neighborhood. And we have a few different car games that we have in the car, but I'm loving that sort of just simple as right, right. How many things can you think of that are blue? You know, Mm -hmm. how many, and that TV show I I watched, I wonder if it was the same uh, uh, doctor that you were referring to, because some of those things were similar and he had to think of how many different uses he could think of for a shoe. Mm -hmm. Uh, And he had the droodle thing as well. And so it can be as simple as when you're doing, going to and from school, having a few of those little activities in mind that you can just do, you know, driving along. Uh, We also do those sometimes over dinner Mm -hmm. as a family, which can be really nice. And I think what I really love about all that is, you know, 
we can tend to overcomplicate things. I'm speaking for myself here. I'm sure no one else does that, but uh, you know, overthink things and overcomplicate things. I'm sure I'm the only person listening who, who might do that. But it's the simplicity of these activities actually improving creativity because, and just, you know, as an interest, that show I watched, when he practiced for a month, he wasn't doing any crazy kind of creativity thing. He was literally just every day find a thing. How many different uses can I think of for a pencil or what have I got around me? Uh, a computer mouse or this cup of coffee, Do you know, like it's as simple as that. And that can actually improve our kids' creativity and our creativity if we're doing that together. It's, it's not sort of this overcomplicated thing that we might think it is. So I love this idea of incorporating those things into just our daily routines, but also I think I'm going to have to check out that book that you mentioned because it sounds really cool. And sometimes mm -hmm. it's nice as a parent because, you know, you'll, you start off well, maybe again, this is just me, but the first week you might do that. You might remember to do it, you know, every day for three days and then you forget, but you do it the next day. And by the end of the second week, you've kind of forgotten about it. And that's sure. when I kind of like to go, all right, where's that book? Give me another idea. Okay, we'll do that this week as a bit of a reminder to, and keeping me on track. So that sounds like a really great resource. But you've, you've got other ideas for us as well, how we can integrate these sort of arts at home as families. So share those with us because these are great. Oh, absolutely. Well, and I think a couple more kind of points on that before I move mm. a little bit more into arts integration. I think sharing is so important. So making sure to carve out that time of, yeah, you did that. And then I got started on, you know, dinner and I, and I wasn't paying attention. They are so proud of what they create. They are just bursting to share with you, to share with sibling, to share with dad, to share with anybody that's around. They are so proud of what they've created. So definitely carving out that time for them to share. And then like you mentioned, oh my gosh, I know that the best of intentions, you know, the best laid plan. And then two weeks later, we haven't picked it back up. So my charge is always this. Could you commit to like once a week for three minutes? And that's it. And maybe you name it. Maybe you tell, tell the kids so that they'll help hold you accountable too. Maybe it's going to be, you know, on Mondays, like we're going to have marvelous Mondays or we're going to have three minutes of being creative. And maybe that's what we commit to at first. Or maybe Thursdays are our slower night. We'll do it on Thursday evening. But what's funny is your kids will start holding you to it because they love it so much. So that was my professional goal as a teacher. I really wanted to embed more creativity in daily lessons and weekly lessons. And so starting really, really small, not feeling like you have to do all of those really fun ideas at once, but could you find three minutes somewhere in your week and say, okay, that's going to be it. That's going to be, you know, Monday right after dinner, we're all going to sit at the table. We're all going to have, you know, kind of one of these activities and we're going to puzzle through that together. Or during, you know, the car ride on Tuesdays, we will play one of these games back and forth while we're driving. So I think that's always great too, is to start really manageable, really bite size with just one little piece and then go from there. And the fun part is it becomes their favorite thing. And then all of a sudden it's not once a week, they want to do it once a day. And it really does seem to pick up speed. So I think that's important. So giving them time to share for sure. And then also starting really, really small and really, really simple. And then letting it kind of build up and evolve from there. Because I know I just kind of shared quite a few ideas, but just starting really small. Another really important piece as we are thinking about Brian Housand is a big name in gifted education. And he has this idea that we want to be sure that we are creating pianos, not stereos. And the first time I heard that, I mean, it was just kind of that mind blown emoji that we want to be creating producers of art rather than just consumers. So we don't just want the stereo that can just kind of mimic what somebody else has done or just kind of see what's already been out there and been done. We want to create the piano where it's just these endless possibilities. It's making the music itself. So really the idea of producers and consumers of the art. And so one way that can easily be done is through really looking at your community resources. What does your community offer in terms of the art? Whether that's a performing arts theater, and that can be a commitment is even once a year that we try to visit either the children's theater or, you know, the performing arts theater that's traveling through town. That can look like going to a visual art museum. If that's something that's of interest to your family, one of my favorite ways to do that is you can, you could give your kiddo like cards if you wanted to, like little index cards, or you could just have 
them kind of come back to these questions, but I love to give them kind of these six charges. So it's not just kind of a free for all roaming. It's we're going to do that. But at the end, I'm going to ask you some questions. And so one of those is out of this entire museum, which piece of visual art do you think is worth the most money and why? So if you wanted to do that on an index card, you could put, you know, a dollar sign and then take that. And the kiddo takes that to which piece of art they think would be worth the most money and why. So kind of evaluating that level of art. Another one, which one would they hang in their home? So which piece of visual art would they, if they could choose one to take home, which one would it be and why? Which one evokes the strongest emotion in your child? And why does it evoke such a strong emotion? What does it make them think of? What does it remind them of? What are they connecting to? Is it kind of the mood of the piece? Is it kind of the tone that it's setting? What's kind of causing such a strong emotion? Which one do they have the most questions about? And having a few minutes for them to kind of share some of those I wonders. What are they wondering about one of these art pieces? Uh, which one would they give as a gift? Which one would they, you know, they see some value in that and they would share that with someone else. And who would it be and why? Or even, you know, which one kind of thinking about multiple perspectives, which one would you want to step inside and explore further? So that's something, you know, just kind of taking kind of, you know, using area experiences, using community offerings. And then kind of leveling those up for our gifted kiddos instead of just taking them to that experience and just a little bit more thought, you know, really valuing them. Again, that's being more of a consumer of the art, but really kind of having them evaluate that and evaluate that experience and kind of make some deeper connections there. So I would definitely encourage parents to think about all of the community offerings to which they have access and how those are going to continue to refine, you know, again, by this point, most of us are in that little C level of creativity where we're demonstrating some growth. Are we able to really evaluate pieces of art and what and speak to what they mean to us and how they move us and, and those types of things? Yeah, lots of great ideas. And I love it. It's just taking that next step of like, okay, we're here, we're at the gallery looking at things, but how can we now engage with and look at things in a different way, in a bit of a game, because if it's a game, then it's always fun of course. Of and uh, engaging. Yeah, absolutely. And imagining which one would we, you know, take home, put our wall if we could. I love that game. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, just uh, uh, giving us permission to play in those spaces yeah. that, you know, feel a bit like uh, really aren't always play spaces, I guess. <laughs> but uh, no, lots of lovely ideas there. I really, uh, value that you've given us lots of examples as parents because sometimes it's just kind of like oh I'd love to do that but where do I start and I think what's really nice about this is the simplicity of it and and it's just about being a little bit consistent uh, as a family and, and engaging and building those creativity muscles but it's really very sort of easy and accessible for us and I think what I was kind of thinking about as well as we're talking, there is obviously with gifted kids, there, you know, a trait is that sort of inherent creativity and, uh, you know, they have that hyperconnectivity. So they tend to think, have that tendency for thinking outside of the box and doing things like that. So absolutely lends itself to growing that muscle within gifted kids. But I guess what I wanted to throw out there what was something I learned that I found really fascinating was. Uh, and I, let me just check what the book is called. It's one of my favorite books and I'm having a brain dead moment, uh, but I will put it in the link because it's okay. an excellent book. I highly recommend it for all parents. And the person, the author who wrote it uh, is a doctor. And what they have actually done is unpacked the strengths within neurodivergence. And I... I kind of mentioned this because one of the things that she talked about in this book was how the ADHD brain, you know, there's a part of the brain in the ADHD brain that controls impulse and in the ADHD brain, that impulse control is just a little bit loose. And so it's harder to control those impulses. And sometimes, you know, as parents and teachers that can uh, you know, be challenging for us to uh, help our kids to manage, but the upside of that is creativity. So what they've linked that to is when we have these creative thoughts, often what people will do is self-censor. Uh, oh, I can't say that or, you know, but 
actually what they found, and this has been shown in, in the research that she referred to, was that in the ADHD brain, because they don't have that impulse control working the same way, they don't have that self-censoring of their creativity. And there's actually a lot of research out there linking ADHD to high levels of creativity. So you know, if your gifted kid is also a, an ADHD kid, uh, just to throw it out there that maybe exploring creativity is going to tap into a potential natural strength. One of the other interesting things in that book, which also stuck with me, was about the autistic brain. And there is that tendency sometimes for autistic folk to do repetition. Mm -hmm. uh, and within this context, what she was talking about was, and she gave this particular example of this, uh, uh, you know, child and, you know, the, the example went on to kind of adulthood uh, and as a child was hyper-focused on music in a particular repetitive way. Uh, you know, that autistic brain was, was really finding a lot of comfort, comfort in that repetition. But she said, what, what then can happen is you move from repetition and mimicry into uh, morphing into the own creativity. So you start off just uh, repeating it the same way, but over time, just uh, mimicking that can actually turn into your own expression of that. So in this example with this boy in music, uh, it started off with a very intense uh, repetition sort of focus on some music, but actually it grew into his own creativity. It started there, but it kind of went somewhere else. And so I think it's just kind of, again, uh, tapping into uh, potential strengths and looking at that neurodivergent piece in a different way uh, within that creativity sort of context. Uh, and because, you know, as parents, we're always looking for ways to support our kids and help them find their strengths. And so uh, there's a lot of sort of scope and things to look at. Now, I will put the details of that book and I'm kind of like kicking myself that my brain isn't just pulling it out for me because I have talked about it before. It's such a good book. And it talks about different strengths of all sorts of neurodivergence. So there may be other things in there that you're interested in as well. But thank you so much, Stephanie. I feel like we're all well prepared now to step into the world and work on our creative muscle. And it's as easy as the next time I'm in the car with the kids, tell me all the things you can think of that's, that are blue. I'm just going to start with blue. It's in my head. <laughs> and yeah. I'm going to go from there and, and sort of, and see where we end up. And so it's really, it's really great to have you sharing those theories and connecting it to these simple acts we can do. And then I think as a parent, having that uh, confidence that actually it is this simple and it can have this much impact. It, we don't have to overcomplicate it. And we can do these tiny little simple things every day that can really work on this creativity muscle that can just be used like everywhere in life. Do you know, any kind of, like you said, uh, you know, any kind of problem solving or, or just getting through life, that ability to look at things in different ways. So a real gift. Uh, yeah. And so thank you for coming on and sharing that with us today. And I know that you're on Instagram and you've got lots of ideas there that you share for parents and educators of gifted kids. Tell us a little bit about that and how people can find you. Sure. Instagram is definitely a great starting point. So that's at Little Miss Gifted. There's a link tree on there that has all the links to the other things that I've done. So I have kind of gotten into the YouTube world and the TikTok world a little bit, sharing some specific ideas and kind of some bite-sized strategies. But just like I did on this podcast today, that's always my goal. Can we break it down to just one tiny step, just one tiny yes? Can I just try this one piece tomorrow? And then you can always check back when you're ready for the next little bite-sized piece. But yes, I would love to see everyone on Instagram at Little Miss Gifted. And like I said, that will kind of direct you to some of the other resources that I'm starting to kind of put out into that space. That's new for me. I just started that in December. And so just a couple months old at this point, but finding great success there and, and loving that opportunity and that outlet to share, not just with the teachers of the gifted, but also with parents of the gifted. So I would love to, to have anyone there, the more the merrier. So all are welcome. 
Thank you so much. And thank you so much for all of your energy at the end of a long day and, and staying up for us. Uh, of course. Hugely appreciate it and look forward to talking to you again. And thank you very much. We're all going to come back and next time we'll all be more creative. <laughs> we'll be yes, working on that. I muscle. have to hear how it goes. So please, if anyone tries any of these, I would love to hear from you. Even through my Instagram, you'll see a tag to email me. So you can mm -hmm. always just go there and that would even help you send me a message of, hey, we tried this or, hey, we tried this. What would you suggest I do next? Or, hey, this was kind of the, pro you know, the products that my kiddo made. What, what do you think about that? Where should we go from here? So I would love to continue that conversation and support however I can. Like I said, could you start with just three minutes once a week? And that's a great starting point. And then kind see how that goes and go from there but yes I would love to to hear back and hear how it's going yeah absolutely and I'll share all of those links in the show notes for everyone so they can find you easily and and yeah we'll have to touch base next time we catch up so thank you so much for joining us today it's it's been awesome appreciate it of course Sophia thanks for having me and anytime I would love to come back and visit the sweet community anytime you'll have me so thank you so much awesome see you soon Yay, if you enjoyed right. this episode and it inspired you in some way, I'd love to hear about your biggest takeaway in the comments. For more episodes, you can subscribe. And to help others find our podcast, please leave a review. You can find show notes and more resources at ourgiftedkids.com. And connect with us on Facebook and Instagram. See you in the same place next week.